Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights, and also the founder of Prep Athletics. And before we get started on today's episode, I just want to remind you, if you like this podcast and don't want to miss an episode, you can go ahead and subscribe on our YouTube channel where you can see what's going on, or we are on all major podcasting platforms and you can sign up there and you'll get a notification um, once the new episode happens. And on today's episode, I am proud to have my friend, Coach Roger Cox on. Roger's the head basketball boys coach at the Raven Gap School located in Northeast Georgia. Uh, after graduating from Tacoa Falls College as a two-sport athlete, Roger worked at high schools in Florida as both a coach and administrator. And he has been at Raven Gap since 2006 and coaches in the same league that produced players such as Steph Curry, Zion Williamson, John Wall, and many more. Coach, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here for sure. Now, fill me in and everyone else out there listening. Where did you grow up? <laughs> uh, well, I was born in uh, Georgetown, Kentucky. Uh, my dad was uh, finishing grad school at UK. Um, uh, when I was a baby, I moved down to Central Florida, just above Orlando, Lake County area. People who are familiar with the area might know of a town called Mount Dora. Uh, this is the area that I grew up, uh, not far from Disney World. Uh, I, my first paid job was working at Disney World. So I was there most of my um, uh, life until college, went up to Tacoa Falls College and then went back and made my way back up into the mountains, which is where Tacoa Falls is. Now, not to skip over to Disney, but what was your job there? <laughs> uh, there's a longer story with that. When I went to a job fair, I thought I would be, uh, I was really excited about my opportunities. And I said, I don't want to do janitor work and I and I don't want to do food service I'd like to work on the rides and they said you're 16 you can't work on the rides uh, so how about busing tables and I said that's that's perfect well what I didn't know is that when you work at Disney primarily like the the, the parks Magic Kingdom so forth um, the people who work in the restaurants and bus tables are the custodial staff so I uh, was <laughs> I was uh, trained in all custodial related uh, jobs there including restrooms and street cleaning and it turned out I absolutely loved it and it was the best thing possible for me so much better than the mundane repetition of working on a ride and saying the same thing over and over again I got to move around interact with people learn so many things so it was great loved it give me a secret at Disney that people might not know Oh, well, I think a lot of those secrets end up coming out like you can watch so many videos. So there's not many secrets left. I mean, the, the thing that is fascinating to a lot of people um, when they first find out is this sort of underground of Magic Kingdom, like the entire Magic Kingdom operates on a level up and underground is most of what's happening in terms of where the employees are located and your break rooms and your food service and your banks and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's a uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, they do a three day orientation. You learn a lot about the history of not just that park, but Walt Disney in general. But that's the thing that usually surprises people is that it just, it's operating on a level above uh, and everything underneath is, is a full, fully functioning, basically city that's going on down there. Interesting. That's a fun fact. I never, never knew. So I have to <laughs> find a YouTube video on that, I guess. There's quite a few. Of all the sports out there, why did you gravitate towards basketball? That's a good question. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't have with my size. I'm not a tall guy. Uh, I just, I think it was not the first sport I played. Football wasn't the first sport I played and I loved it even as a little, little kid. Um, but uh, I was really intense, I think. Uh, and basketball provided like a constant engagement. I didn't have time you know, to rest. Baseball, I was good at, but it was boring. And uh, basketball, it was constantly going. You're always on offense or defense, engaging teamwork, and just that intensity uh, drew me to it. Um, and I played multiple sports like football, basketball, baseball. I played some soccer. It just basketball kept being the most in, in front of my interest because of the constant engagement. Gotcha. And then from that, you wanted to, you ended up being a basketball coach, obviously. What got you the coaching bug? 
Uh, I always, I think, even as a kid, acted like a coach. I always tried to control, not, I don't know that control is the right word, although in some cases I'm sure it was, but if I played pickup ball with friends, I would always want the um, disadvantaged situation. So if there was three of us, I'd want to be on the one. If there was five of us, I'd want to be three against two and I'd want the two. And I wanted to strategize how to figure out how we can win this competition, whatever it was, athletic or otherwise. And so that was always sort of in my mind. And then as I graduated from high school, my coach and I, and I would get coaches awards, but normally it was, it was on the verge of being coaches award or kicked off the team. I was always right on the edge. I, I was really, really just intense all the time. And um, so I, I graduated and my uh, coach asked me to uh, lead some of the summer teams. Uh, or, or a summer team. And then I think he went away on vacation and I led the varsity team um, just after graduating. And I remember one particular game, I think I was already heading toward coaching, but one particular game, we were down, I think 30 at the half and I made some adjustments and we came back and won. And, and I love that feeling. And, and that's basically what I've been trying to do since then. And also I wouldn't, it would be wrong with me not to mention that I had a high school teacher that was never my coach. He was a football coach. I quit playing football after 10th grade. It was brutal. I was not capable of avoiding getting smashed every time I got hit. And I was playing basketball and baseball too. But he was a, a guy that was a science teacher, which I did not care about science, but I loved him and what he was doing. He had played uh, in the NFL a little bit. He's a gentle giant and loved his academics and inspired me. I took two science classes my senior year simply to be in his classes and I did not need the classes and he I just thought I want to be like him he had this great infectious personality I'm really nothing like him he was tall and impressive and gentle and I am short and unimpressive and aggressive and uh, yet I just loved what he accomplished with himself and towards other people he made me want to do things that I didn't necessarily think that I wanted to do, such as science, different sciences. And I just, he was inspiring and, and I wanted to be like that. Do you and, find yourself now as a coach incorporating some of his statements to your players? I, I, I think to some degree, but they're, they're subtle because again, he was so, he was so gentle. His responses were more patient. I remember one time getting in trouble in his class. I was trying to be funny. I just thought the world of him and I, and I thought I would say something funny and it, it really just came across as um, just rude and disrespectful. And, and he didn't say anything to me. He just quietly walked over to his desk and started to fill out a referral form and didn't really engage with me. And it just broke my heart. And I, and I pleaded with him that I did not mean to come across that way. I was just trying to be funny and enjoy his class. And I was so apologetic now. So I do the opposite of that. I tend to, I don't, jump people so much now, but I'm more aggressive in, in my response to that. I'm not as um, calm and calculated. I have a little more direct approach, but I hope that in some ways I do emulate the way he inspires people. I hope he ended up, he actually passed away not long after I graduated in an accident in an ultralight plane accident. Um, which was sort of typical for him, just trying new things and being adventurous. And I, I was I, funny, real quick. I, I I saw him not long before not not long before that, actually randomly in a small town in Georgia. I was on a basketball trip with my college team, and we had stopped into a shopping center. It was near Christmas. I didn't have any money, so I sat in a yogurt store with my friend, and uh, somebody tapped me on my shoulder and said, "Mr. Cox." And I looked up and it was, it was uh, him, Coach Wettstein. And um, he just happened to be in the area. He saw my college coach or my college coach saw him with a high school jacket on. He knew I went to where to school. He told me, he told him, hey, Roger's over there. It was so great to have seen him. And that was the last time I saw him. And it, every time I drive by there, it's on the Interstate 75 and now north or, north or south. And I, my heart just feels good and bad at the same time when I drive by there. Right. That's great. You had that great connection with a guy like that, that now has you coaching and changing lives as well, whether you know it or not. So it's uh, that's a great story to hear, Roger. I agree. I'm grateful. Yeah. Now, obviously um, I help place kids in prep schools across the U S and 95% of them are located in new England. 
And whenever I bring a family, uh, uh, some options for prep schools, uh, and I bring your school up, they always ask me, well, that's in Georgia. Uh, and all these other schools are north of there. Um, why should we, why should we look at Raven Gap? And I said, well, you know, I said, it's, it's one of the oldest prep schools, south of Virginia, uh, if not the only brick and mortar one. And it's got great education, a great coach. And I was like, just talk to Coach Cox and he'll, he'll fill you in on everything you need to know about the school. And then you can go from there. And um, so tell me what, what, what's your uh, elevator pitch to parents when they ask you about Raven Gap and, and it being in the middle of Georgia with not really many other prep schools around? Well, that conversation might be a little bit different depending on where the family's from and what their um, objectives are. Um, but if I were to sort of generalize it, uh, we are uh, we are quite, if somebody knows about boarding schools, first of all, so I have a lot of candidates that I speak with that don't know much about boarding schools. So I have to do a little bit of education there to begin with, but let's assume they do. I would say that there's something really unique about Raven Gap in that it, it is a different um, type of place and it was founded for a different reason. And so it always has had a little bit of a different approach of more humble, transformative um, gathering of people from all walks of life. It, it doesn't have um, you know, the background of a tremendous amount of years of high, um, affluent and successful people. It's, it's more starting from somewhere and building and creating and transforming. Now, more and more we're having, you know, we're attracting and have been for about 20, 25 years, uh, a, a more clientele that has a similar approach to the Northeast boarding schools. But um, there's just a genuineness to this place. I always end up saying about this, this analogy about the, the, the roots of something, the seed of something. I think that really tells something, the fruit that is produced from that. Um, in anything, a person, an organization, obviously any living thing. And I think the, the foundations of Raven Gap are, are um, coming out in the fruit, uh, the, the seeds, the roots. And, and it's just a humble, grateful, hardworking, high aspirations, sort of dreaming uh, place. And that's why it was founded. And ironically, our founder went to the Northeast to be educated at Harvard out of this uh, Appalachian region with no real reason to go there. He just made his way there and then became successful in the business world, very connected in the people in the late 1800s, you know, the Carnegie's, uh, Vanderbilt's and, and families like that. And he was in Texas at the time, I think doing really well and, and just decided he and his wife, we need to go back where we were and help other people be educated. And, and this, this was the public school and the private school. Uh, it was the only way to get educated in this, in this little pocket of the Northeast Georgia mountains. And they started changing lives back then. And it just has continued that regardless of what the current um, era is, the, the intention is to find people who wanna be here, whether they can afford it or not and try everything we can to help them um, you know, succeed in their as high aspirations. Gotcha. Now let me ask you a straight up basketball question here. What's the advantage of playing at Raven Gap versus the New England prep school? Our league, it's interesting. I mean, New England prep schools, I don't know it extremely well, but I know it somewhat have some good friends that are coaching in the area. And I know it's always been good basketball. I think it's had a real boom um, in the last couple of decades in terms of really high level. So now those leagues are great. Um, uh, but our league is really good too. Uh, I think outside of uh, postgraduate leagues, it's one of the best leagues in the country, North Carolina. We, we are in Northeast Georgia, um, about an hour and a half from Atlanta, but we play in the North Carolina independent school athletic association. So that's how we played with some of those that you mentioned earlier, uh, which is a phenomenal league with not just really great, um, athletics, but really good schools. And so that alone is a great, um, reason to come here. We have so many pockets of good coaches, not in high school, colleges that are really close. And then we're also uh, really close to Atlanta, which is a hotbed for basketball in the country. And so you, you can't go any weekend without an available option to go to some city in North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, or even Tennessee. 
uh, you, you can't, you, every weekend there's some place you could go for an event, a showcase event, um, camp, clinic, and we just have access to so much great basketball in this area. Uh, and then um, I think uh, another, another aspect of it is the, a little bit similar to what I said before, just the, the, the heart of the place is so compelling for the right people, you just feel it and you feel like you're part of a family. There's something really interesting about being here that everybody feels like it's their school. It doesn't feel like a school for one group of people and then others can come. It feels like it's everybody's home. And that's a strange and unique and beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. How do you choose players for your program, Roger? It's, it's changing, you know, I, this is my 16th year. And when I first came, um, they were really terrible athletically. The school at the time was um, highly regarded academically, even more highly regarded artistically, um, visual arts, performing arts, everything, just they were excellent. And one of the charges of the head of school at the time was to balance that out athletically. And to be quite honest, I was the first coach in that new wave. They hired uh, me, um, and I was a good candidate for that because um, I had success in Florida, but I didn't need it. I actually had moved away from coaching. It was in administration at the time, and it was tough for them to hire somebody who was really good and qualified and interested, but I wanted to be here because I wanted my kids here, and so um, I had a, a larger reason, and I just said, I can come here and help us learn how to be more competitive. Well, now, everybody, all the other programs uh, I mean, I don't know if this is the right phrase to say, but they're bypassing what basketball has done. We've really become very competitive in basketball, but our other teams have become more competitive. Football is outstanding. Baseball is outstanding. Boys and girls soccer. Boys have been really outstanding and girls on the rise big time. Volleyball, I mean, all and on and on. I don't mean to leave anybody out, but it has turned into what some might be uh, – accused of being imbalanced for athletics. Um, mm. And that's not, I don't think that's true. I think we're quite balanced. Um, they just, I think some people weren't used to the athletics being as good as they are. Um, but um, uh, I got going on, on answering your question and lost the original question. Well, how do you pick players for your, for your program? <laughs> so, okay. So, so picking players is um, a unique journey and it's changing that's why i started that whole thing it is changing early on it was um essentially anybody who was willing to come here that could do anything and wanted to work hard uh and we had some wonderful kids that helped change the the dynamic of the program which then allowed a couple of other people to come and so now uh, I would say we're a little more selective in that we're looking for people still who, number one, they want to be here. I, what I want as a coach and as an admissions person is my number one objective is that you, you should look at what we are as that's the place I want to be. And um, because if you come here and regret it slightly, then it's just not fair to anybody. So that's the number one thing look, I'm looking for is you see the value in what we are as a school, as an academic institution, and as an athletic option. And then you say, okay, that's what I want. I want to be trained by these people that I've met. I want to be motivated and encouraged. And, and so that's, that's my lead. I, I often tell really high quality athletes over the years, you know, if you have lots of opportunities, lots of options, and you're really trying to leverage that, I encourage you. I don't want you to uh, bypass any of those. And if you want to come here and be patted on the back and made to feel good about every day and, and treated special uh, in a special way, then you shouldn't come here. Well, you need to blend into the community and want to be um, part of this larger entity and, uh, and be humble. So I'll be humble, be grateful, work hard, have fun. Those are my primary things. And, but now we're getting a little more selective. We have a team that we can construct um, and uh, our head of school is uh, on board with looking at it. In fact, he's had more experience at a previous uh, boarding school where they built a powerful athletic program. And so his guidance is influencing how we look for players. Um, he's able to give us some directives on, on how to um, look for what is the right option. And, um, and more and more, we're looking for young guys, ideally.
right. you know, not ninth grade. We even have junior boarding. So whenever they can come in seventh or eighth grade boarding, it's even better. And tell families out there why you guys want them for more than just one year. Mm. Because mind you, like half my bit, more than half my business is postgrads, but a lot of schools like yours want kids in the system for more than one year. And just explain to people why stereotypically a school would want that. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's, there's so many aspects to it, but um, I think one, the recruiting, you know, if you're going to move to a new area, especially you're basically starting at ground zero. Um, unless you already are carrying with you a pretty good amount of um, notoriety and people are, you know, either following you or offering you, you're going to have to become known in the midst of transitioning to a new place. And that includes academic transition, social transition, emotional transition, and learning how to play in that region. Referees call in different, the, the game differently in different regions. Um, style of play, coaching, teammates. That first year to year and a half is all acclimation. Some of it is beautiful and amazing and other times it's really frustrating and you need that time to, I like to think of it like this. I, I, I use this analogy, which may work for some more than others, but I want the basketball player particularly to see themselves sort of like Batman. Let's, let's be in the background working on all these uh, different types of uh, tools and, uh, and skills so that nobody sees. I want you to be somewhat unknown and then come out really fully developed. Um, and if you come here in your junior year, for example, um, it, it, you know, definitely as a senior, like you better hit the ground running. You have to have be fully acclimated in every area. And that's, that's really hard to do because how you're doing academically has an impact on how you feel overall. And are you getting the right sleep? Are you worried about being away from home? So if you can come here in ninth and 10th grade or any boarding school, and you can basically develop a foundation of all those other things, learn how to study, learn how to organize, learn how to move forward. And then, and you're working on your skills in the mornings or the weekends and the evenings, and then you can come flying out of the gate. I love to see late recruit. I, I think they actually do better if they're not getting a ton of exposure early and then their game becomes solid and they eliminate the different gaps that coaches and recruiters can see, particularly if they're not elite athletes. If they're a good player and not elite athletes, you want no holes in your game. And if you get, if you get out there too soon, um, too much too soon, I think that sometimes comes back to, to um, be a problem in the recruiting process. Right. Well, thanks for sharing all that. That's, that's, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, one of your hats is that you work in the admission office and I've emailed you plenty of times and you've said, Hey, Corey, I'm in this country or I'm in this continent and tell everyone out there why you as an admission officer, uh, travels the globe. What, do, what are you doing that for? Um, well, we've, we've also grown a lot in our country. Um, we have a, almost 60 countries represented now here at the school. I think when I first started, it was around mid, mid teens, maybe 14, 15. And um, we just sort of ran, you know, in, in some occasions randomly had a student come and then we would go visit that place. So if we have some people from a particular area, we go back and visit that place for multiple reasons, but primarily to take advantage of the relationships that we have there with those families and meet with their friends and contacts and then try to grow that market with other students from that area. So when we visit, when I visit, um, I start with spending time with those families and that's a benefit unto itself. We're gonna come and see you sometimes in their home. They will welcome us in, make meals, show us around. That alone is worth it because the, the, the relationship that we have with those families just solidifies, they feel confident, it's good for their children that are at our school. Uh, and then they introduce us to other people. I might create an event at some venue and interview on the spot other families. And that face-to-face -face connection and, and then the borrowing of trust from other people just helps the network grow really strong. So when people send their children to our school, they normally know somebody who has been here um, either very closely or indirectly, and the confidence in us starts out high. 
Um, I also make my services available for basketball. Anybody I know in the areas being a basketball coach, I often have some contacts there, or that may be the contact. And I say, I'm willing to come do basketball workouts or whatever you'd like me to do. And very often I end up leading, whether it's 10, 15, 30 kids in workouts all around the world. And, um, you know, purely just offering my services. I don't claim to to be anything particularly special, but I love to offer what I have experienced and, and people are grateful and they like the idea of American coaches. They, you know, we teach things maybe a little different. Um, uh, and so obviously I think we wouldn't do it at all if it wasn't a business decision. I mean, we're trying to generate more students from those areas, but the, the core of it, the, the, the the real value of it is the relationships that we solidify. Um, I was just thinking this yesterday when I was driving, I literally have what I would consider very strong friendships in dozens of countries around the world with open invitations to be staying with them, you know, uh, or staying in their homes that they have somewhere else. Uh, and uh, I'm really, really grateful for that. They're just, I feel, I, I, I do, I've done some yard work for people in other countries. I just happened to be visiting them and they had yard work to do. And I say, I'll help. Um, you know, I do other favors. Just, it's wonderful. And tell me, once again, I use this in my, in my conversations with families when I tell them about the benefits of prep school. And one of the benefits I say, is the last one I mentioned, is that you're going to be in a prep school with kids from all over the world, right? Why don't you give me your take on why that's important for kids? I have four children. I came here with that being one of my primary um, hopes was that their experience was with people from other places, other cultures, other um, backgrounds and experiences. I just find it to be extremely useful for my own children. Why is that? It's tough to put an exact description on but I will say that my children have, similar to me, have relationships with people from all around the world uh, as I do. And while there's a sort of cool benefit that you could travel anywhere and have people to go and see and things like that, the other, I think the, the most useful thing about traveling and having friends from other places is the awareness that Generally speaking, the world is full of good people, almost entirely, almost entirely, and they are thinking very similar to all other good people anywhere in the world. They want their children to be educated well. They want them to be cared for and to have comfort and peace. They want them to be challenged in a safe environment. And they, they, they just want good things to be happening to everybody else. And I think that's a bit elementary to realize that. But at the same time, when, when you don't experience people from other places, it's hard to really believe that. You know, I grew up in a pretty small area of Central Florida, didn't have a lot of connection to the rest of the world. And there were assumptions I made unintentionally about places and people. I don't think they were bad, but I think they were ignorant. And just traveling around the world, meeting different people and engaging with them is, uh, it's both um, a buildup for, for yourself, but it also kind of tears you down a little bit. It like creates a humility in you. You know, I and or we are not necessarily <laughs> better than anybody else, but we're not necessarily worse than anybody else. We are very similar in our hopes and dreams and aspirations and skills and mindsets. And I think that's really, really valuable for all people to understand. It would help a lot right now as it would, as it would in any time in history, but right now, maybe more than ever, we need to experience people from other places. Yeah. You hit it on the nail there. I mean, what's, there's just, the percentage of Americans that have passports is just shockingly low. Mm. And there's a percentage of uh, Americans that never leave their county ever. Some never leave their states. And I've always told the kids I've coached or mentored that, you know, more important than 
buying fancy fancy things for the money you make at your eventual job, you know, use as much money as you can to travel the world. Because you're not going to be on your deathbed thinking about the car you had at age 42. You're going to be thinking about the experiences you had, the connections you made, um, you know, the people that were in your life. And, you know, you've traveled a lot. I've traveled a lot. Now, when we see a news report on a country, we can be like, yeah, that sounds about right. Or, eh, I've been there. That doesn't sound like something that place would do. So it gives you a perspective um, that you're not going to get just, just watching one news channel or another here in the States. So I agree with you completely on that. Tell me this, uh, these fun little facts. What's the, your favorite country you've ever been to? Oh my goodness. That is such a difficult question to All answer. Right. I, I, and, and this is, I'm going to say this and I am going to give an answer. And I, and I, if anybody else <laughs> that are my dear friends in all the other countries, um, I don't mean anything other. <laughs> I love your country as well. It's so difficult <laughs> to choose. Picking your favorite kid. It's like that kind of question. It's so difficult to choose. Um, but it kind of caught me off, caught me off guard. I didn't realize about this country and I'm just craving to go back and spend time there and it's slovenia absolutely beautiful lovely people access to more beauty it, it borders italy um you know it's, it's sort of on the west north end of the yugoslavic countries and just it's just lovely and it's it's like a hidden gem um but i mean so many i love the like lithuania and poland you can't help but love places like Germany and France and Spain. I mean, all those, but those are kind of, kind of understood to be great. Um, but all those Yugoslavic countries are wonderful too. And I'm spending more and more time there and the people are, you know, they all have a little bit of difference in that, you know, a little bit of a personality difference, but their roots are all the same, their care and their love and their gratefulness and kindness. But man, Slovenia just got me. I, I, I was shocked. And, uh, I told my wife, I was like, I think if we were to move somewhere, I would try my best to move to Slovenia and live wow. there. That's great. I've been to Bulgaria for a wedding once and it, it floored me too. Or I had I just was going to be in and out for a wedding and it I just fell in love with it. And I don't know if I'll go back because there's too many places to see. And I I do I, feel that right now. There's too many places to see right now. I feel a bit overwhelmed because I want to get to so many more and I don't know that I will, but I'm gonna try. Now, 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 let me ask this, uh, this next question is what country do you really want to see next that you haven't seen? What would be top of the list? If I said, Roger, I got a plane ticket for you and your family right now. Where would you go? These are so challenging, but, and I don't know that I've thought through this enough, but the first thing that comes to mind right now is Iceland. Mm -hmm. um, I, we've recently had a student that um, we've accepted from Iceland and, and I already had an interest to go to Iceland but that has sparked me a little more and I'm going to see if I can work it into my travels. Um, because I think the reason why it pops out is, that, is because it's so different. I mean, it, there's so many more countries um, in Europe and in Africa uh, and in Asia and, and uh, the Middle East. I mean, I really, I could also put on top of that list that I'd love to go to Afghanistan or Iraq. I really, really want to go there. Um, but Iceland right now, it seems like it's possible because of my recent connection there. And it's so different than all the other, um, places I would go, um, currently. So that's, that's why it jumps up out of the top. Well, just, you know, one of my jobs in the air force was uh, a project in Iceland, right. Upgrading the, uh, air defense systems there to new technology. And I had to go there for a week for a conference and, uh, Wow. It's one thing we got up the plane and I went straight to the blue lagoon, which is a natural geothermal pool. And, uh, after getting out of there, I had no jet lag, sleep like a baby and just had the softest skin all week. So, um, <laughs> if you decide to go there, I've got a little, a couple things to tell you what to do. Oh, fantastic. I definitely will uh, be in contact. In Iraq, I was there too, uh, not by my own choice, but by the U S militaries and, uh, have nothing there to tell you except the uh, Baghdad airport and, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what they have to offer there. But, uh, you know, and the thing I noticed in Iraq just briefly is, yeah, I met people there. They weren't they weren't part of the insurgency or part of the problem. They're the, the nicest people you can meet. And uh, they, just, yeah. they just wanted to not be in a war zone. Right? I think, yeah, that's what's amazing to me is you meet people and it just completely melts any idea that you have in your head that's created from other sources, whether it's news, media, movies. That, though there are some realities, it's just such a small fraction. Like the people are what, 
or what matters. I, I, I was um, having an interview with a student um, and their family. They, uh, they go to Iraq um, each year, uh, though they've had to pause it. Uh, to do some missions work mm -hmm. uh, in the dental field, they go and help in Iraq, and they and they they were talking about it, and I said, now the student that didn't end up coming here, he ended up going to another school, and he's lovely, and I, I think he's great, and I just said, well, I had mentioned how interested I was, and they we maintained that relationship, and said, when we go, we'll be in contact, and we'd love for you to go. So I've got an open invitation when the time comes to go to Iraq. The second part of that is I have to if my wife will <laughs> will be okay with that because I'm sure that'll be a bit unnerving. She, she's a little nervous about me traveling in general. Yeah. And, and there are things you got to consider, but I really want to go spend time there and meet with people. Yeah, no, let me know when you do that. That'd be great to follow up on that. Hey, we got this, uh, the, the uh, part of the podcast we do every week called Famous Alumni from Your School. So you ready to, to play this game? Sure. Okay. These are a couple of famous alums from your school, and you tell me if you know them, and uh, and tell me what they do. And I mention their name: John Hotzclaw, Josh Holtzclaw, Josh Hotzclaw. Well, then you know, <laughs> do know who he is. Tell me who Josh is. <laughs> uh, I was really close with his father. Uh, I knew him a little bit. His father was here when I came here. Uh, he was a bit of a mentor to me. His father was as the dean. I became the dean of the middle school for a bit. Josh is an artist, a physical, uh, a visual artist, and he was known to be really good at that when he was here, and we did not even overlap. I think he had just graduated from here, but always knew about him and knew he was, you know, doing really cool things, and his dad would tell me about different jobs that he was doing, and they were cool, and then uh, recently over the last several years, it's pretty common that um, we hear about and then see some of his uh, movie work. Uh, the most recent one was the movie uh, Soul, a Disney movie that came out, and he was listed as one of the uh, lead artists uh, on on that movie. And I thought, you know, obviously that was fantastic. But I've seen other movies where he was on uh, the credits as well. And I'm not an artist. I would, couldn't tell you what he does or how he does it or what realm it is. I couldn't answer any questions about that. I just know that he's really gifted and had his own talents, but then was trained here at the school with our art, um, art teachers who are phenomenal. So, and he's a good guy, really, really, um, everybody that knows him is, you know, a big fan of his and, and he does great work. Yeah. He also worked on Luca and Toy Story 4, just to yeah. add a couple more movies. And, big yeah. time hits. Yeah. He's, he's good. All right. Nicola Lambic. Oh my gosh. He, he's one of my favorites. Uh, you said earlier, it's hard to pick a favorite and, and it's true. I, I, I might say that phrase a lot, but he, um, so I came here um, and then the next year he was a la last minute enrolled student. I had nothing to do with it at the time. They just told me there was a kid from Serbia that had a, a attempted to go to a school in Texas and everything fell apart. That's pretty common. And if you're not going to a brick and mortar school, uh, post-grad or prep school, you know, there's such a so many bad places out there and that's he was involved with one and he was all ready to come and it all fell apart and um his brother was a professional basketball player at the time in serbia um uh peter lombich and he had played over here in the u.s in the jordan brand classic he was a professional and his family was looking at nikola and they said he's a good basketball player but i don't know if, how, if you know what happens in some of the countries if they're really good at sports they basically get taken out of regular education. They do the bare minimum, they play on a club team and they don't get educated well. And in all reality, they end up playing a limited professional career at decent money and then they have nothing. Mm. So their family was like, we gotta get him out of here. Well, we didn't know anything about that. It all fell through at the other school and the guy helping him, who I don't know who it is still, I'm. He was aware of the 90s when a group of Bosnian kids escaping kind of the turmoil in that region came to the U.S. on a basketball trip. A couple of them stayed the night here on our campus without any intention of coming to school, school here. That led to a few of them coming to school here, having a great experience. One of them actually is now one of my best friends because he came and taught here. He ended up coming back to teach here, and I love him. Well, that guy remembered that school where those Bosnian guys stay. What was that school? And he contacted us. Next thing you know, 
this kid, Nico Lalambic, is coming here, weighed about 125 pounds, about 6'10", couldn't lift the bar over his head or press it even. By the end of that one year, he worked so hard, he probably could have been a Division I scholarship guy, but he ended up at an NAIA school, valedictorian, mm. played basketball, was, all you know, like freshman, all conference, et cetera, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that didn't matter. Got a full scholarship to NC State to work on chemistry. And he's now Dr. Nikola Lombic working for ExxonMobil and his parents sort of risky plan, unknowing what they were doing has turned out exactly the way they wanted that they used basketball to get him to an opportunity to make his life something really valuable, important, not that everybody's isn't, but like he's accomplished something with basketball as opposed to playing basketball and then the candle burning out. Um, and I couldn't be more proud of this guy. I just think he's one of the nicest people. It also is a little bit of a disservice. It made it tough for other Serbian guys because we've had a lot of Serbian students since then, since then. He was one of the nicest guys and most conscientious people ever, maybe more than anybody I've ever met. And, you know, not everybody's like that. So we, you know, a lot of people here thought, oh, all the Serbian kids are going to come and be in super nice. Well, some of them aren't super nice. <laughs> some of them are, are just growing up and learning how to navigate life and they're perfectly fine, but they weren't perfect like Nikola was. Anyway, he's awesome. Love him. All right. Last one here. Kevin Mubundu. Oh man. He's another really great story. I, he was here in seventh grade. He's from Rwanda, played basketball, um, could have played in college, decided not to. Uh, he's now the CEO of a, of a coffee company in Rwanda. I bought, I purchased some of his coffee. I purchased it here in, in a large amount to give away to people. Uh, he's absolutely great, but I, here's a quick story. I'll tell you his, um, 10th grade year, he flunked off our basketball team. Um, and uh, he was just goofy. He, he didn't, he didn't take things seriously. And he, I remember he called me when he found out um, he was here on campus and he was going to be ineligible. And he was called me and he was upset, kind of crying. And I said, well, now's the choice, you know, you're going to either turn things around or you're going to keep going that direction. And, and he did. Now, fast forward to his senior year, um, which he had turned around. He's great. I loved him. And he was, we were on a great team that year. We ended up in the final four, probably the, probably could have won the state championship, just ran into a buzzsaw Christ school who was winning their fifth state championship in a row that year with the Plumley brothers. Um, we lost to them four times that year, five, four or five times out of seven losses. But um, Bundu, Kevin Bundu was playing and he was practicing and he wasn't really going very hard and we were doing really well and I just I just went after him in practice one day and it was funny it was over a break nobody else was here just basketball they were staying at my house in the basement he quit and he left the practice and walked home and I sent the other coach to find him and he's like coach I couldn't find him I, I just followed his footsteps in the snow and uh and he went back to my house where he had to stay and he had just quit so I, I brought him in to my car and I was like so you you got a tough tough situation here and I challenged him about why he was even playing he told me one thing I said that's bull that's not why you're playing you know either if that was true you'd be working hard so I, I challenged him on that and then I was like so here's the deal you can't go anywhere you're at my house we got a game tomorrow either go in the locker room and get your uniform on and come out and you'll start because he was a starter and we won't talk about it anymore because you'll be telling me that you're all, all in or go in the locker room. And when they come out, you come out in your street clothes and sit behind the bench and then we'll move you, you know, into another thing later. And either way, it's up to you, hundred percent up to you. He came out, played, never talked about it really again until, you know, later. Now we laugh about it. He called me not long ago during the pandemic and was just thanking me for everything, you know, like a lot of times they do. And, and we went on and he was very instrumental in us uh, advancing uh, into the final four and was fantastic. And, and that was a pivotal moment. Both the flunking off was pivotal and the quitting was pivotal. I love those moments. Those are some of my favorite coaching. That's a great story. <laughs> Is the coffee any good? The coffee's fantastic. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, Kivo Noir. Kivo is Noir. Coffee. Yeah. yeah K-I-V-U Noir. Yeah. He's, he's does a great job. They deliver in the U S um, and he's doing amazingly. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was this uh, week's segment of famous alums from your prep school. So thanks for filling those in, Roger. Gladly. 
Uh, you mentioned we mentioned at the beginning of the very the very beginning of the intro that you play in a conference that's produced the Plumleys, the Currys, Zion Williamson, and I know you played against Zion in his last high school game. What's it like uh, coaching against such high level players? Is there any insights you've taken away uh, facing these guys? You know that experience goes back even into Florida, coaching against some really great players in so, in multiple sports. Um, and one thing I often have said to kids today is that if you were to take a guy like a Zion or anybody else that's been very successful and then you rewind back to when they were in you know ninth tenth grade it's almost always not a surprise but not the physical part it's something about the way they carry themselves mentally physically like emotionally they just have a different presence about how they function um and, and so it's the, a professional attitude and work ethic and approach far before they become a professional. It's not a unique type of thing to say, but, you know, you basically you dress for what you want to become. You act the way you want to become before you get there. And so that's what I usually see in these guys that are pretty high level in the long run. The Plumleys come to mind. They just had a presence about them, not just on the court, but just as people. And they were good people. They were focused. They enjoyed the experience. But, and I wouldn't say they weren't goofy because these guys were actually kind of goofy. They did some fun and goofy things, but they were focused on what they needed to do. And they had other people around them doing the same thing. And Zion is a great example of that. That guy was the only player I've ever coached against or coached myself that impressed me physically. I, I, other, you know, people are impressive. That's fine. But in, Generally, you know, it's not that new. There's people that are athletic and can jump and run and shoot and all. He just had a different level of size and speed and agility and presence, but he was a great guy to his team. And his coach just couldn't speak more highly of him. I mean, he was so impressed. And I knew his coach for a while um, before that. And we've talked some after that, but. Just the, I think what people don't realize is that the majority of pe people that become professional at anything, there are a few that were jerks when they were younger and succeed, but some become a little bit more arrogant when they get to that spot, when it's now deserved, they've earned it. They, and now they kind of like, you know, play the part, but most people that become really great are pretty humble uh, and good teammates and just work hard. That, that's that's the roots and it again it's not anything you know surprising to hear but that is what i've observed and i think is the most important you know it's ironic about zion is he could have gone to any high school in america for free they were trying uh -huh. i know i know many of them that were trying and there were rumors and and that was what's so impressive about him is that he had been around these people and those teammates and he just wanted to stay. He, he liked them and his experience was fine. I wish more would be able to make that decision, but I also don't blame people. In all, in all reality, I'm sort of asking people <laughs> to leave where they're at, you know, and try something new. Um, but it, it was impressive that he stayed. And, um, and I think it was good for him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, real quickly, do you guys still have a circus program in your school? One of only two in the country. Tell me about that. That have a circus program, I believe. I don't know of any others. The other one is in, in the Atlanta area. And the guy who started that one is the one who started our program. So circus arts, you know, Cirque du Soleil and all the different shows they have around the country and in the world um, is unbelievable. I, I had no idea how great it was until I came and saw the students performing. My daughters have performed in it, one of them more than others. Uh, she has gone that route into performing arts. She's at Wagner uh, in Staten Island, wants to be a, a, an actress. Um, and but they, I, I mean, they just basically make a performance and include various acrobatic work. And they might have apparatus where they're hanging from something and twisting and turning and flipping, or they might be jumping and tumbling on the ground or some other apparatus. I, I think if you haven't experienced it, particularly if you have experience in high school students, 
it, you just have no idea how to, it blows you away. Um, they're, they're a lot like athletes. I mean, they're basically athletes in how they prepare and get their bodies strengthened and work on their particular skill. You know, if they have an apparatus that they're supposed to perform in, they just keep working at it, keep working at it, keep train, fail, train, fail. Um, and then the show comes together with live music, some acting, some singing, and then these different performances that enhance the show. You know, it's usually a theme, you know, there might be something like The Hobbit they did a few years ago, or they might do a classic show um, uh, that it, it is another, like a movie, and then they just turn it into a circus performance. Jeez, that's great. And now, do you recruit kids for that reason? Does the school? To some degree, although it's a strange thing to recruit because you don't have a lot of, you know, younger children even aware that they can do this. So it's a smaller pocket that are aware they can do this. A lot of gymnasts end up in there. So like we don't have gymnasts, uh, uh, gymnastics here. Um, we don't have competitive cheerleading. And so often people that are in that realm that like to be competitive and athletic, they might gravitate towards that. But there's a fair number of students who come here with no awareness that that is something they might be good at. Even athletes sometimes, and they stop being in the sport they've been in and they gravitate towards that. But there are some who are becoming aware of it. There are more and more are popping up around the country um, combined. Like if you have a, a studio that has different types of dance, you, you now are starting to see the circus arts will, will show up in there. So uh, there might be doing some apparatus. So it's, it's rare, but it's becoming more common to be in our applicant pool that say we're coming for the circus arts program. Right. Right. I just mentioned there's other prep school in new England that has its own zoo. There's one that oh, has its own flight simulator. Yeah. Uh, I just think some of these, these outlier programs are just a nice little uh, touch that schools can say that makes them different than maybe their competition, right? Not necessarily you're even going to work in the zoo or, or fly the flight simulator, but that just shows uh, just the links these schools will go to to offer different opportunities to kids. So I think the circus program for your school is just really an outlier. A um, couple sure. more questions here. Did you do any outside the box coaching changes during COVID that you came up with that you incorporated with your team? <laughs> well, I had started the year before COVID, strangely, coaching from a microphone. So I was actually already a little bit prepared to move in that direction. I, I don't know why I started doing it. I just, um, I, I have a pretty loud voice and I can command the space as coaches do, but there was something about, I, maybe just one day I decided to get on the microphone over by the scorer's table and direct from there. And, and I just liked it. So I wasn't down on the court, like moving around. And I just was letting them do whatever they were doing and correcting them along the way. And, you know, saying, you know, either stopping it or letting them keep play, but being the voice of God over there playing. And, and so we were already doing that. And then I just kept doing that. It made, it made it really easy uh, because we didn't have to be close to them and, and um, you know, be in the six foot space. And um, so that was one um, we did some training. Uh, we had some limitations early on, but then we allowed to go out and train, but we couldn't have, you know, this wasn't that unique. I think a lot of places did this, but maybe we'd have six guys at a time working out and they'd all have their own ball, not passing to each other, not rebounding for each other. And we would do workouts with that, you know, so now you're at your own basket doing your own thing. We're coaching you on spinning and we're doing it from the microphone. So we were able to get quite a bit of work done while remaining quite distant from everybody as we were preparing for a time that our league and our school decided it was safe to play. And we ended up playing the season mostly with masks. Okay. Being that we played in four states, every state had a few different rules. You know, you had South Carolina, which didn't have many rules. Georgia had some with different bench or Carolina was different. Tennessee was different. So it was a really interesting year having a lot of different um, approaches to uh, how to handle that. Yeah, well, that's cool. The microphone, that's uh... <laughs> you're probably saving your voice too doing that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I tended to get, you know, that really like scratchy voice and loud, but um, I still have a, I can be that way, but I just enjoyed it. I feel like I can communicate a lot more simply that way. I, I never thought I would do that, I, but it just works really well. Gotcha. Uh, 
Last big question here. What are your thoughts on the NCA transfer rule? Hmm. I, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't think too much about it. I, I think ultimately every time we have big changes in anything that are new to us, it seems like it's going to create enormous problems for tradi traditionalists, especially, and again, in any area, but as at, for the most part in our world, we adjust, we make, you know, the, the, the people and the systems, they swing the pendulum and get things working right. And I guess in the end, if I, if I think if we're going to make a mistake, if we're going to make a mistake as an organization, NCAA transfer, I would say this mistake ought to be in favor of the students. Mm -hmm. So it, I don't know if it's the right thing to be as open-ended. I don't really know, but I would rather be more free in support of their opportunities as opposed to more restrictive. So I think it's probably fine. And in the end, it just requires schools and coaches and programs to do a good job. Yeah. And I think part of that too, a lot of the gripes from the college coaches are there's not enough life periods. So you're having a lot of transfers because coaches didn't get to evaluate a kid, learn all they could about them, uh, really figure out if they're a good fit for their program. So I've heard that being, you know, talked about and a lot. I'm sure they're not wrong. I don't envy being in that position. I think it's, but I also think that for the most part now, obviously there's a pretty wide disparity on what people are paid. You know, the highest levels are paid astronomical amounts. Bless them for that. No, I'm not opposed to that. Others, but even in the lower end, they get paid pretty healthy salaries and you know you're in a you're in a competitive industry figure it out you know i mean other people are in competitive industries and they have to figure it out at much lower rates of pay um so figure it out um you know just what i always say to people that i work with that are also coaches particularly apply the same expectations to yourself you want people to be on time for your practices and be prepared and not complain and do what you want them to do even if they don't agree well then you do the same yeah. You know, if you want to be more open and gracious and see that, okay, well, kids need this and that, well, then you can do the same to others. Like a lot of coaches, a lot of educators are very high expectations about their environment. You know, be at my class and be prepared. And yet they show up to meetings late, not prepared. That's garbage. You know, whatever the standards are that you're expecting of other people, you need to do the same. And I think coaches don't stay in that all the time. They want their players to be fully invested, great teammates, buy into stuff they don't necessarily agree with, follow the directions, even if they're not 100%. Well, why don't you do the same? Right. You know, you have, you need to model the behaviors that you're wanting. But if it's worth it to fight and you let your kids fight things within your program when they should, which I actually like, I prefer a student to be willing to fight if they should, but then teach them when they should. Um, I think that's great but make sure you're operating on both sides of that. You know, if you want that liberty to do and say things, then make sure you're giving your athletes the liberty to do and say things that they should say. Yeah. Let's do a lightning round real quick. Uh, what's the biggest one in your career? <laughs> uh, probably, I guess, Greensboro Day, who, who's uh, got a legendary coach, um, um, Freddie Johnson in, in Greensboro. I mean, he's, I don't know how many wins he has now. I think the most North Carolina final four, it was the quarterfinal game. Nobody expected us to beat them. They had beaten us. They were beating us by 30 early in the year. We, we beat them in the playoffs and, and uh, nobody was expecting it. We just had a great game plan. My kids played hard and kind of beat them pretty bad too. That's pretty oh, funny. Nice. Who's the best player you ever coached against? I mean, Zion probably is the best player I've played against in terms of overall. I, I've never been that impressed as I was with him overall in every capacity. Gotcha. What are your hobbies when you're not coaching? For a long time, it was really just coaching and coach re coaching related interactions. <laughs> um, I do like to play golf. I don't care to play that much because then I'm angry at it. And I'm not really angry when I play now. So if I play a minimal amount, I just enjoy it and enjoy the people. Um, uh, shoot, being at a boarding school, I don't know. Do we have any like hobbies? Uh, it's just taking care, <laughs> driving to the airport, picking kids up, talking to parents, answering WhatsApp messages. But I do, I do like to play golf. I love to watch 
golf um, majors particularly. Um, and uh, I like to hang out with friends, make a fire. Right now, I'm cutting down a lot of trees and making firewood. So that's what really what I do when I'm not involved with something scheduled. Let's call you Paul Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Last but not least, what is your favorite movie of all time? Man, when I make this, when I have this discussion, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't answer so quick, but like I go through a whole process of like, how, get it into a category that I'll be okay with. Like, is it comedy? Is it not comedy? And I have to do all those things to narrow it down. Give me a and, couple and, of your top three or four. Well, that's... every time I do this though, I'll tell you my, every time I do this, I end up narrowing it down and I got to go with um, Hoosiers. Like uh -huh. I end up that that's my favorite. It has the combination of all the different things. It was so meaningful in my life. There's a lot of different connections there, but that's great. Fletch, the first Fletch movie, I think it's like vital, like ingrained into my life. Uh, you know, I just, and, and then Shawshank Redemption always comes up is really great. I, I, I really, really love any of the versions of Les Mis, any of the movie versions. I love that story, the redemptive story The I even love the, the musical version. I love anything related to that. It's very powerful to me. So those are a few. Okay. Well, Roger, thanks so much for being on today. I know you hopped on last minute here and we've chatted for all these years. And I just, I wanted to give a perspective on a school outside of New England. And you're one of the only brick and mortar prep schools outside of Virginia, New England. So I think it's a great perspective. I think you shared a lot about your school and what makes it unique uh, as well as your coaching philosophy. So thank you very much for joining today. Um, once again, we're going to say, if you like this podcast and you know someone that would enjoy it go ahead and share it with them have them subscribe um you know i people aren't going to find this on youtube it's going to be through word of mouth and just people finding out more about the prep school basketball world and the high school basketball world so that's what the mission of this is is just to let people know the options out there have as much information as possible uh so you know you you know a little bit more and you have options and to me options equal power uh so the more you can learn about this world uh, the better. And you can always reach out to someone like me, Coach Cox, reach out to him with questions. I will be more than happy to answer any of them you have, but we're just trying to make this a resource for everybody to, uh, you know, be as informed as possible. So Roger, thank you so much for joining today. And um, we'll see you. We'll see you around the world somewhere, right? I hope so. You do great work. I really appreciate it. Have a great, have a great one. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in the Prep Athletics Podcast. We'll see you all next week.